This is the Chase and Sanborn Hour, and this is Don Amici. Tonight, we welcome back to health and heartiness, W.C. Fields. In this, we are joined by Edgar Bergen and his famous dummy, Charlie McCarthy. Dorothy L'Amour, Hollywood's latest singing glamour girl. Dick Rogers and Larry Hart, two of America's leading composers, and Ray Middleton to sing Rogers and Hart's most striking composition, golden-haired Anne Harding, back from the London stage, and her husband, Werner Jansen, America's foremost conductor, who interprets one of the hit tunes of the day, Too Marvelous for Words. Hey there, I'm Mike Gillette, your host, and this is 1937, Part 5 of the Soundscape series, Episode 37 of When Radio Ruled. This podcast is a montage of excerpts from old-time radio shows performed live and broadcast February 21 to March 8, 1937. Starring Father Coughlin, Douglas Fairbanks, Errol Flynn, Rudy Valley, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Eddie Cantor, Jimmy Wallington, Bobby Breen, and more. Featured songs include Rudy Valley, Let's Go Slumming, and Here in the Moonlight, and Bobby Breen, Trust in Me. These soundscapes are a result of the research phase of the When Radio Ruled historical documentary series. In order to find the best old-time radio excerpts to express the essence of the era, I listen to hundreds of hours of old-time radio broadcasts, looking for the most interesting bits. When I hear something outstanding, a song or a joke or a comedy sketch, a news report or an interview, I add it to a best of clip reel so I can easily find all the best excerpts for the documentary. But not everything can get into the final version. For 1937, I boiled 6.3 days of programming down to 27 hours of excerpts, from which a little under 5 hours made the final cut. And it seems like such a waste. Listening to these clip reels is one of my favorite parts of the process. I don't remember what I put on each reel, so they contain one unexpected gem after another. And I want to share that experience with you. These excerpts are offered without commentary for your entertainment and education. So here are voices from 1937. Voices sadly now silenced. Great performers living again because you're listening to them perform live now. Hollywood Boulevard is one of the busiest streets on the West Coast. 
but I recall a conversation with Charlie Chaplin, who stood on one side of the boulevard, and I on the other, calmly discussing our new pictures. Interesting, but how could you hear each other with all the traffic noise? Well, the only noise then was the sound of oranges growing in the groves that lined the boulevard. In those days, western pictures were at their height, and cowboy actors would spend the morning being photographed on horseback, chasing invisible Indians or shooting them from behind rocks and trees, and then after lunch, these same actors would be dressed and painted as Indians, and they'd be filmed running away from invisible cowboys. <laughs> when the picture was screened, it was not unusual for the same actor dressed as the cowboy to shoot himself dressed as the Indian. <laughs> Actors were very versatile in those days. You've been in pictures for 20 years, Doug, but no one will believe it, judging from your looks. Pardon me, did you say uh, looks or lux? <laughs> oh, good going. And since we're on the subject of lux soap, one little word about what Hollywood studios think about it. I'll do better than that, Bart. I'll say two words. It's tough. Thank you. And now, from your experience as an actor, director, writer, and producer, what's your opinion of radio in Hollywood? The radio has probably become the biggest asset to motion pictures in the past year or so. I believe each helps the other, so long as entertainment maintains the standard set by the Lux Radio Theater. In the silent days, actors like polite little boys and girls were seen but not heard. But now you hear them whether you see them or not. Thank you. Bye, Doug. Errol, you're leaving tonight on a new trip, aren't you? Yes. Flying to New York in an hour, and then I sail for Europe. I hope to get a look at the Spanish War, and on the way home, perhaps uh, spend a few weeks in South America. But uh, that's enough, I think. script called Waikiki Wedding, but he has to go down there with the whole company to shoot the picture, that glorious sun-kissed island of the Hawaii. Songs by Leo Robin and Ralph Ranger, who gave him love and bloom, this is one of them, Sweet is the Word for You, on Bing's Waikiki Wedding.
say about Edgar Bergen, but then there's no need to say anything new. His little partner, Charlie McCarthy, is currently America's boyfriend, and Edgar is sitting pretty. I don't even need to tell you anymore that Edgar is a ventriloquist, that Charlie is his dummy, and that what sounds like two voices is really only one. Here they are, Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen. Charlie, why are you sitting and pouting all evening? Well, I'm, I'm just not happy, that's all. I'm not happy. Well, what's the trouble? Well, there's, uh, there's certain things around the studio, things that are said and attitudes. I don't make me happy. <laughs> and I don't like very much the introduction that Rudy gives me. Oh, I see. No. Well, what's the trouble? Well, I just don't like it, that's all. And one thing or another, and they all pile up, and I worry. Oh, right. <laughs> I've worried and worried. I'm just a bundle of nerves. Oh, I see. Just a bundle of nerves, that's all. Twitching, too. Yes. Wait, there I go again. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, it's awful. Yes. Would a longer introduction make you happy? Uh, yes, that would make me feel better. It would. Mm -hmm. And if it makes me feel better, you know, it makes me feel better. Yes, of course, yes. Well, now, just what is wrong with the introduction? Well, you see, Rudy says, uh, presenting Charlie McCarthy, the facetious dummy, assisted by Edgar Bergen, see? Yes. <laughs> well, now, why can't we leave off assisted by Edgar Bergen and all that? You, know? <laughs> you drag in all the help, and where are you? <laughs> well, when do I get any credit? Well, if there's time, I'll slip your name in. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's nice. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know. And anything else? Uh, yes, I don't like that word facetious dummy. That isn't complimentary. No, no. It should be something fancy. Charlie McCarthy, handsome or intelligent. That'd be nicer. Can't you think of a nice word, Mr. Bergen? Well, now, let me see. It. Yes. Something that fits you. Yes, it must fit me, sure. Yes. Well, how about, uh, uh, Charlie McCarthy, imbecility personified? Uh, that's nice, yes. <laughs> Yes, class. Yes, of course. Yes, now that means something. That really means something. Yes. What does it mean? Well, it's a very fine expression. Yes, I like that. Imbecility personified. Yes, that's nice. Yes. Personified. That means kind of in person. That's just what it means. Oh, that's nice. What does imbecility mean? Well, that means, uh, well, it has reference to intelligence. Intelligence, yes. Brains. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's me. That's me. Yeah. Imbecility, that's me. Yeah. Imbecile, imbecile, imbecile. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, pineapple you turned out to be. Yeah. Fine hunk of stuff that was. Yeah. So you're even double-crossing me, too, huh? Yeah. Just for that, I'm going to make you sign that contract. Oh, now, come, come. I want to raise every month. Every month? Yes. Yeah. And what are you going to do with all that money? Well, I have to think of my future, you know. I'll soon be old enough to go to reform school. <laughs> yes. Well, Charlie, I... I don't like to sign contracts. No? No, I just don't like to sign. Well, I'm afraid of contracts. Yeah? Yes. Afraid of contracts? Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Silly boy. Silly boy. Yes. <laughs> Why, a contract is nothing but the meeting of two minds on a piece of paper. Mm. Where one guy gets the worst of it. Yes, yes, yes. But you don't trust me. That sort of hurts me. I don't trust anybody. Not even my own dog. Is that so? Uh, why, has he tried to double-cross you? Yes, he did. I was having a little mix-up with Skinny Dugan and getting the worst of it, too. I see. So I stick my dog on him, and my dog bites me. Oh, that, that, is, that is awful. It certainly is. But I got even with him. That's fine. I ran home and drank his milk. That's fine. <laughs> well, you got even. Oh, if I have to, I can be nasty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you'd still let Skinny Dugan get the best of you, huh? Yeah, but that ain't gonna happen again either. Oh, no. Oh, I've sent away for a muscle-building course. I see. Mm-hmm. I got a free booklet for nothing. Well, that's fine. Yes, all I have to do is buy a pair of dumbbells for $8. I... <laughs> Save money on the booklet. You certainly did. <laughs> Well, Charlie, I, I didn't know you were a weakling. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Bergen, I, I've always been P.U.N.E. You have? Yes. 
Oh, yes, I'm not well, really. Oh, I've always been so puny. <laughs> so very puny. Yes. I look strong, but I'm not strong. You're not? No. I can't lift the piano. No. I tried the other day. It didn't work. I didn't know it was nailed to the floor. Why, no. like, you know, a few years ago, I was so weak. I was so weak, I couldn't even raise my voice. Oh, my, my, my. Yeah, awful weak. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, and I would, I would sit for hours and just hang my head. Hang your head. That was the only exercise I had. Oh, I see. Oh, I tell you, I was in a dilemma. Yeah, what? A dilemma. You were? Yes, yes. When was this? Four, 34. Yes. It... I see. With wire wheels. With wire wheels. <laughs> <laughs> then I had my operation, you know, appendicitis. Oh, you did? Mm hmm Then you have a scar? Uh, yes. But I had such a wonderful doctor. Yes. It didn't mar my beauty. Uh, oh. <laughs> he did all hand sewing on me. He did? Mm hmm he used the lazy daisy stitch. Oh, well, fine. Yes. Well, you were fortunate to have such a fine doctor. Yes. I'm glad I didn't have a buttonhole maker working on me. Mm. Collection Plumbing on Park Avenue is from the production on the Avenue. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. Here they go! And they're on their way down the stretch. The break was good. Every horse got a chance just as they left there. And as they come down here to the eighth pool, it is uh, time supply and special agent. Special agent is trying to force his way to the front, and he's going to do a good job of it as they pass the stand. Here on the outside comes uh, Rosemont in a good position. And as they go by me, it is special agent on the lead by one length. Special agent has the lead, and then comes uh, time supply in second place right along beside him. Going to the first turn is Special Agent by a length. Time Supply is second. And on the outside of him is Accolade. And Box Thorn is close up. Far back in the crowd, uh, on the inside in about 12th place, is Red Rain. Up there close is Rosemont in about 6th place. They're going into the stretch. They've gone uh, They've gone half a mile. And the time for the first quarter over this track was 22 and 2 fifths seconds. The half in 45 and 4. They're turning into the back stretch with Special Agent on the lead. Special Agent has a lead now of one length and a half. Uh, right behind him comes time supply. And in there is... Uh Slipping through on the inside is the other one of that uh, entry. Uh, uh, special age Indian broom is going up on the inside now in a good position. Around that far turn is still no change in the positions. Uh, Rosemont is having a hard time working his way through. He's now in sixth position, going around on the inside. He's saving ground. He's got plenty left. If he's enough horse, he may get home. And on the outside, here comes the other one of Indian Broom. And Golden Eye is moving up from the rear. Here comes Accolade in second position. And Sea Biscuit is now moving up and is challenging as they turn for home. It's Special Agent and Sea Biscuit challenging head and head as they swing into the stretch. And they've only got a quarter of a mile to come. They step the first mile in 136 and four fifths. And that shows you what this pace is. He can't live at it. Sea Biscuit has got the lead halfway down the stretch. But here comes one of the Baroni entry on the outside challenging boldly. And the battle is on. Indian Brood is coming fast. And here comes Rosemont between horses. And Rosemont may take it all. It's going to be a photograph finish. And it's anybody's race right to the end. I think Rosemont got the money. And I think Rosemont was first. It was an eyebrow finish. And uh, Sea Biscuit was the second horse. Sea Biscuit was second in one of the Taylor entry. I think Indian Broom was third. It was very close. That was an eyelash finish. Rosemont was closing strong, but Sea Biscuit hung on gamely. The time of the race was two two and four fifths, which makes the track almost identically like the track of two years ago. Well, one of the most thrilling finishes I think I've ever seen in a horse race in my life, Clem. The crowd down here has gone completely mad. The photographers are outside the charm circle, which is a, uh, a white circle here where the winner will come up in just a moment. Newsreel photographers are setting up on every hand. The horses are just coming back now, and uh, everybody, uh, depending on who was their favorite, was shouting Rosemont. Sea Biscuit. One would call Rosemont one Sea Biscuit. There are a half a dozen here who are ju just as sure that Rosemont won as Sea Biscuit. They don't know what to think of it. One of the most beautiful driving finishes I think I've ever seen. Hey, hold, Pollard. Here's the photograph finish. Hold it. All right. Hold it now. We'll be ready for it. Just a few seconds and we'll know the winner of this race. 
got the race coming up. Right? I think Rosemont won it, but that's only my guess from where I stand. Uh, the photograph will tell us the actual winner. The naked eye is not as good as the photograph. We'll have it in a second. They're looking at it down there. I know it was an eyelash finish. Either horse won by a whisker, and that's all. Just the... about a quarter of an inch. I can't see any more between them. I really shouldn't express an opinion on a finish that close. And they're still waiting. That shows you how... Uh, what a difficult... There it is! Rosemont is the winner. Rosemont by a nose. All right, Clem. Sea Biscuit is second. Clem. I'm just a minute, buddy, till I get it. Rosemont is the winner. I want you to get that jockey if you've got him. Sea Biscuit is second. And the Taylor entry finished third and fourth. They haven't put up the distinguishing numbers. And they finished very close together. If the government wants a radio program, I'll try and help you. Let me see. First... First, you need comedy. Oh, uh, what comedian should we hire? Oh, you don't have to hire anybody. Remember, you've got Congress. Uh, 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 well, uh, yes, sir, uh, that's a good idea. Say, we might use all of our government employees. Good. By the way, you've got one fella. I can't think of his name, but he's awfully good on the radio. What is his name again? Fra- uh, uh, yeah, well, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Oh, yes. He made good on the radio. Made good. After his first series of broadcast, his sponsors took up his option for another four years. <laughs> Won't you buy a stamp or two? We use the best kind of blue. Citizens must not be lax in paying up their income tax. If you send us your request, we'll sing the numbers you like best. Republicans and Democrats have all stopped talking through their hats. Rally round our president, for he's the most efficient gent. We'll be on the air each Sunday night and everything will be all right. These days there's a tax on everything. But you don't have to overtax your motor by using an inferior gasoline when you can have fire chief at no extra cost. In these 48 United States, you'll find 45,000 Texaco dealers, an army of servicemen, ready to give you that extra service on which you pay no gift tax. Tonight or tomorrow, drop into the nearest Texaco station, fill your tank with lightning action fire chief gasoline, and ride with the nation on the road to prosperity. See, Mr. Government Man, for the music, you could have something typically American, Yankee Doodle, as Jack Renard is now playing it. Cantor, you're making good progress with the program for the government. Now what? Look, to be on the air, you must retain the goodwill of all your listeners. Most people dislike paying their income tax. 
we can make it pleasant for them. How? By getting famous screen stars to act as income tax collectors, like Joan Crawford, Gene Harlow. Well, how would that work out? We put a scene on the air showing Gene Harlow as an internal revenue hostess. I'll put on a blonde wig and play Gene Harlow while Jack plays some appropriate income tax music. What will I play, Eddie? Play all of me. Why not take all of me? Uh, stop pushing. I want to pay my money first. Wait there. a minute. I'm here. I'm Wait here. I'm going to pay boys, first. one at a time, please. One at a time. <laughs> Jeannie, Jeannie will take care of all of you. All right, mister, you're first. <laughs> Hello, baby. Hello, you big, handsome taxpayer. <laughs> here. Here's a little kiss. Here's a little kiss from Jeannie. <laughs> oh, here. Here's my check for $10,000, Miss Harlow. $10,000? Is that your income tax? No, that's my income. <laughs> <laughs> your income? Well, listen. Can you afford to give me all of this? No. But in my condition, do I know what I'm doing? <laughs> Oh, he's fainted. He's fainted. Put him, put him on the ice with the other ones. He'll be all right. That's good. Drag him right off. That's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, here you are, Miss Harlow. Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. Is that all you meanie? Well, I didn't have a good year. Well, I don't care. I wouldn't take two hundred dollars. All right. All right. Here's two fifty. Oh, make it three hundred, will you? Now, uh, listen. If I give you three hundred, I'll only have a hundred left. Oh, you still got a hundred. Well, I have to work on you. Well, well, well. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me the hundred, will you? All right. All right. Here you are. Now that I'm broke. I haven't got a cent. Well, take this form and fill it out. Fill it out? What for? Now you're on relief. Goodbye. <laughs> Mayor Cantor, that was all right, but not dignified enough for the government. No. We need someone who is brilliant, clever, with a great personality, a person who could answer every question, mm-hmm. an individual whom people would love at first sight, a man who... Stop would... hinting. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Here we go. I'll help the people with their income tax in a dignified manner. Now tell me, who who is the first one? Well, here's a foreigner out here who needs a little help. A foreigner? Bring him right. Come right in, sir. Come right in. Come right in. Come right in. Just just tell me what uh, what is it? Uh, where can I see Mr. Pravati? Pr- there's no Mr. Pravati here. That's funny. I just see his name on the door, Mr. Pravati. Pravat. The sign says private Pravati. Oh, God. Tell me what. What, what do you want? Introduce me to the manicurist. Manicurist? What for? I want to get my income tax file. Yep. Oh. You want a manicurist to file your income tax? Yeah, I want to get it off my hand. Oh, quiet, quiet, quiet. <laughs> All right, let's, let's fill out this form. Now, are you single? Are you single, married, or divorced? I used to be single. Now I'm married. Divorce is yet to come. Yep. <laughs> something. I must know here, is your wife working? Sure, just because I married her, she doesn't have to start. You, you, you mean to say you send your wife, you send your wife to work? Not me. I just wake her up. She goes herself. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, according to section one, I can allow you $400 for your wife. Boy, just give me $20 and you can have her. Stop that. You'll get used to that stock. Look, oh, come, 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 come. Now answer the question. What, uh, what deductions do you claim? First, take off $180 for hay. For hay? You bought $180 worth of hay? No. I was counting my money on a breeze. Someone hollered hay and I dropped my money in the river. <laughs> but look, look, there's no place in this form to enter such a loss. Put it right there. Where? Under sinking fund. Yeah. <laughs> Now, 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 tell me, tell me, do you, do you own a car? Yes. You own this car by yourself? No, I got partners. Well, who are they? The Pacific Finance Company. <laughs> the, the Pacific Finance Company? Yeah, me and the finance company is partners. No, 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 you and the finance company, you should have put them first. No, they come after me. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. It says here, state if you had any business operations. Yeah, they took out my tonsils. Yeah, well, it's a good thing they did, because you're a pain in the neck to me. Don't say that. That annoys me. Uh, oh, go away. 
Let's get this over with, will you? It says here, when when were you married? In 1932. That's five years ago. How many children have you? Five, one for each year. Oh, then you are allowed $400 off for each child. $400 for each child? Uh Uh-huh. Boy, am I mad. What are you mad about? I had a chance to get married in 1896. (laughs) And just for that, I ain't going to pay my income tax this year. Well, let me tell you something, mister. If you don't pay your income tax this year, the government will put you in jail for two years. Is that so? Well, let me tell you, the government can't put me in jail for two years. The government can't? Why not? Because I owe them three years in jail from last year. Get out of here, And now, and now, Mr. Government Man, you could win the East completely by presenting a young New Yorker, my adopted son, Bobby Breen, who sings, Trust in Me. Yes, Bobby. Please trust in me in everything you do. I want you to have the same faith that I have in you. I feel in my heart we can both see it through. If you'll only trust in me. Why, you're the best kind of a pal a kid ever had. You've been a brother, a teacher, you've been a friend and a dad. Oh, I know I'm the luckiest lad. Oh, you trust in me. You taught me right from wrong. And gave my heart a song. Now I'm living all day long. You show how much I Like it, mister? It was fine. With Bobby Breen, we have the East. With Bob Parrish, the South. What about the North, the West, the Hawaiian Islands? Jack Renard, that covers everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have I have just one more suggestion that you can take back to Washington. Listen. Don't put a tax on the beautiful girl. How can I live without love? You can tax my business and all that I own. But have a little pity, leave my pleasure alone. What'll I do on a beautiful night if I should happen to fall? 
suppose that I'm about to kiss a beautiful maid. What if she discovers that my tax isn't paid? So don't put a tax on the beautiful girls, or I won't get any loving at all. Don't put a tax on the beautiful girls. How can I live without love? You can tax my soda, I'll pay it somehow. But don't you think the price of chicken's high enough now? What'll I do on a beautiful night if I should happen to fall? But if you have to put a tax on beautiful vamps, let me be the guy who goes around with the stamps. Oh, don't put a tax on the beautiful girls, or I won't get any love at all. The Johnson Wax Program. Presenting Marion and Jim Jordan as Fibber McGee and Molly. Say, looky here. Now, McGee, stop looking at the picture of that lady dressed up mostly in goose pimples. Shucks, Molly, that's art. Looks more like Eve to me. <laughs> no siree. That's Gypsy Rose Lee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll read you the headline that goes with the picture, Molly. Let's see. Morton Minsky claims no vulgarity in striptease. Mm -hmm. mm. Striptease? What's that? Is it something like a comic strip? <laughs> well, that depends on who does it. <laughs> This here, this here Gypsy Rose, she's, uh, she's an expert at the teas. Hmm. Yeah. I suppose she works in a little Gypsy Teas room. <laughs> no, that's pretty far-fetched. <laughs> that's what they said about me, Uncle Dennis. That time he swallowed the poker chip and they fetched him 40 miles to a hospital. <laughs> Did he have openers? <laughs> Did you get it, Molly? I think... Ain't funny, Molly. Okay, okay. <laughs> Your deal. Well, shuffle the paper and turn to something interesting. Okay. Broadcasting Company. Fibber McGee and Molly will appear in person at the Municipal Auditorium in Junction City, Kansas, on Wednesday, March the 3rd. How do you do? I am Professor Seymour. I am Charlie McCarthy. I am a professor of astrology and palmistry. I am uh, Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> Are you interested in the future through palmistry and astrology? Uh, yes. I just think it's too supernatural. It's just too divine. It's just so occult. Oh, it's wonderful. It's just too utterly supernatural and kindred stuff. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Well, uh, do you know very much about the Zodiac? Uh, well, uh, very little. Very little, yes. 
And when I say very little, I mean just that, I imagine. <laughs> well, do you know that the Zodiac is divided into 12 constellations? Is it really? Marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> what won't they think of next? <laughs> oh, that is interesting, yes. Yes. And I want you to know, too, that this series of 12, uh -huh. it moves westward from the vernal equinox one degree every 72 years. Is that so? Yes. Well, I can't wait that long. <laughs> It takes over 25,000 years for a complete circuit. How long for a short circuit? No. <laughs> now, what do you know about the Zodiac? You mean uh, Zodiac bicarbonate? I do not. <laughs> Awfully sorry. <laughs> Are you familiar with the name uh, Aquarius? Uh, no. Uh, Scorpio? Uh, no. Gemini? Gemini? Gemini. <laughs> Gemini? Yes. Is the last name Cricket? It is not. <laughs> Awfully sorry. <laughs> Awfully sorry, I'm too. Yeah. If you don't know anything about the subject, young man, uh, why don't you keep quiet? Why don't you listen? All right, all right, I will, I will. You don't have to bite my ears off. All right, yes. Now, would you like to have me read your palm? Uh, yes. Yeah. How much are you going to stick me? Well, it will cost you uh, 50 cents. I'll give you a quarter. No, 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 no. Huh? I can't do it for less than 50 cents. Well, if you can read the future, why do you want to waste your time reading palms for half a buck? Well, you see, Charlie, as a matter of fact, money means very little to me. Yeah, well, then read it for a nickel. No. <laughs> well, I will give you a reading. Thanks awfully. Yes. I, I will have to hold your hand. Uh, well. I say I will have to hold your hand. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know you very well, all that. <laughs> now, you'll have to take your gloves off. Uh, my what? Your gloves. You'll have to take them off. I haven't any on. Oh, you haven't. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> haven't had any on. Oh, I see. Haven't had any soap on them either. <laughs> all right, Professor. I don't have to come here to be insulted. Oh. I can get that at home. <laughs> at better prices. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I can. Yes. Now, you have what we call a spatulate hand. A bra? A spatulate hand. Marvelous, isn't it? Yes. All your fingers are the same shape. Yes, five of a kind. That's right. <laughs> now, you will notice that the nail on your thumb, uh -huh. or rather on your index finger, yes, is very broad. It's what? The nail on your index finger. Yes. It's very broad. Yes, it is. There's a lesson there. Uh-huh. Do you know what it means? I certainly do. I won't stick it in a ringer again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, the four principal lines in the hand is the life line, the head line, the heart line, and the fate line. Mm -hmm. Some line. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, the head line could start from two places. Well, why doesn't it? Well, it does. What are you arguing about? I'm not arguing. <laughs> it's impossible for me to give you a reading under these conditions, young man. What's the matter? I must have it quiet. Yeah? Yes. How about soft music? Well, that would be even be better. I can whistle Yankee Doodle backwards. No, 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 no. <laughs> you wouldn't care for it. No. All right, go ahead. I can see in your hand a great deal of travel. Yes? Yes, an adventure. Mm hmm You like to travel? Yes, I do. It's a gypsy in me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, do <laughs> Oh, Yes, it is. Yes. Well, have you had much experience along that line? Yes, I have. You have had experience? Yes. I had a funny one last night. I was coming out of an alley. No, 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 no. No, I mean traveling. Traveling experience. Yeah, well, I was traveling. Oh, you were. <laughs> Full speed ahead. <laughs> you know, a traveler usually has a destination or something to lure him on. Did you have that? Uh, no, but I had five guys chasing me. Oh, you did. <laughs> you, uh, you are a man of a very happy disposition. Yeah, but how about money, a fortune? Well, I'm happy to tell you, Charlie, that, uh... That you will inherit ten thousand dollars. I will. Yes. Woody, woody, woody. I'm rich. I'm rich. Woody. The lollipops are on the coffee. Woody, woody. <laughs> but through some legal trouble, you're going to lose the money. Huh? <laughs> Boy, I went through that in a hurry tonight. <laughs> yes. But one fine thing about you, you are cheerful. Yes, I am. I will say that. You are you are a very cheerful nature. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you radiate sunshine. I do, uh... I say you radiate sunshine. Oh, definitely, yes, yes. <laughs> Everybody calls me Radiator McCarthy. <laughs> uh, knock, knock. <laughs> well, young man, I'm not going to go ahead with this reading. Why? It's just impossible for me to give you a reading. Yes. I must have cooperation. Uh-huh. You see, in spite of my years of study of the subject... Yes, of course. There are times when I feel as if 
I don't know a thing about it. Yeah, well, that's the way you impress me. <laughs> Names make news, and to the long list of newsworthy notables who have appeared here with us, we add tonight the name of a hero policeman, Patrolman Gerald Hendricks of Armonk, New York. A few days ago, Jerry Hendricks made front-page headlines all over the country when he faced down the bandit guns of Merle Vanderbush and two companions and captured the trio after they had stuck up a New York state bank. Vandenbush, dubbed public rat number one, by none other than head man, G-Man Hoover, was wanted from New Jersey to Wisconsin and was reckoned a mighty tough hombre until he ran into his nemesis. The nemesis, by the way, is six feet two and weighs 185 pounds. He was born in Indiana 26 years ago, was high school wrestling champion of that state, had two years at Indiana University, and all in all stands for everything that is best in the new type guardian of the law. Allow me to introduce an officer and a gentleman from Indiana, Patrolman Gerald Hendricks. <laughs> Jerry, how long have you been a hand on the long arm of the law? About two years, Rudy. I see. Just a rookie. You ought to do pretty well after you learn the ropes. Well, I still have plenty to learn. You know, the day this thing happened... I was an hour early for work. An hour early? You must love your job. It's a great job, all right. But that isn't the reason I was early. No? No. You see, I had to drive my wife and her mother to the dentist. And after I left them, I had an hour to kill. Jerry, if it's all the same to you, would you mind using some other word than kill? Why, sure, Rudy. What would you like? Couldn't you say you had an hour to spare? Okay. After I left my wife at the dentist, she asked me how I was going to kill... <clears throat> I mean, spare... The extra hour before going to work. And I told her I thought I would ride around a while with Sergeant Hergenhan of our force and learn how to be a cop. He must be a pretty good teacher. He's about the best there is. Well, I just reported to the sergeant's booth when an alarm came in from headquarters at White Plains that the Northern Westchester Bank at Katona had been stuck up. We were told to be on the lookout for a couple of men heading south, dressed in mechanics overalls. That wasn't much of a description to go on, but it was the best they had. How much money had been stolen? $17,500. And up in Katona, that's not hay. Nor anywhere else. <laughs> After you received the alarm, what did you do? Well, we both knew that if the crooks were heading for New York, there were only two roads they could take, and that both of them came together at an intersection about 100 yards from our booth. Yes? The sides took one road, I took the other, and Officer Orman was stationed further up the line. Then we began to stop all cars. I put the B on 15 or so and was just about ready to admit there wasn't any use when a small coupe came along. Was there anything about it to make you suspicious? Not at first. The fellow driving it was well-dressed and didn't act nervous or anything. But there was something about his eyes I didn't like. But I thought the hold-up men were supposed to be wearing working men's overalls. So they were. But just the same, I ordered this fellow to get out of the car, gave him a quick frisk, and then walked around and opened the luggage compartment in the back. I tugged at the handle, but couldn't get the thing open. And I figured that it probably was stuck. But it wasn't. What was the matter with it? Somebody was holding it down from the inside. That was rather ducky, wasn't it? No. Did, did you know it then? No, I didn't. I just kept working on the handle, and pretty soon the top came up about six inches. Yes, go on. And with it came a pair of guns pointing right at me. That's even more jolly. Now, what did you do after that? I changed my tactics completely. Slammed down the top and yelled for Sergeant Hergenhan. Well, he was quite a distance away, and meanwhile, the two thugs who had been trying to keep me from getting in were now plenty anxious to get out. They kept shoving up on the top, and I kept shoving down until the hinges finally broke. Did they get out? They did when the sergeant arrived. He covered them. I disarmed them. And then they came out of Mika's land. Tell me, Jerry, what does it feel like to look into the business end of a gun? I've been trying to figure that out ever since it happened. It was the first time I ever had the experience, and it wasn't very pleasant. But that wasn't when I got the real chill. No? Well, when did that real chill occur? About two hours later. We brought our three prisoners to the police station for questioning, and the G-men arrived. 
They looked over the situation for a while, then one of them went up to the fellow sitting opposite me, who'd given his name as Richard. He looked at him a minute, and then he said, Hello, Merle. When did you dye your hair? It was the rat. You mean you didn't notice Vandenbush before? No, sir. We'd had plenty of circulars about him being a tough guy and a killer, but I didn't recognize him from his picture. When that G-man named him like that, I realized who I'd been dealing with, and my knees started to act kind of queer. And, well, figure it out for yourself. No, thank you. I'll leave that little job to you. One thing more before you go, Jerry. Are you going to quit police work now that you've become rather famous? Well, Rudy, I don't think I've become very famous, but as long as I can get around without crutches, I'll be a policeman. It's a great work. We don't get much money, but we have lots of fun. If your idea of fun is having public rat number one stick a gun at you, you can have my share. Thanks very much, Jerry, for coming up tonight, but stay away from those crossroads at least for a while. Oh, I don't know, Rudy. They've done all right by me. When four years ago we met to inaugurate a president, the republic, single-minded in anxiety, stood in spirit here. We dedicated ourselves to the fulfillment of a vision, to speed the time when there would be for all the people that security and peace essential to the pursuit of happiness. We of the Republic pledged ourselves to drive from the temple of our ancient faith those who had profaned it, to end by action, tireless and unafraid, the stagnation and despair of that day. We did those first things first. But our present gains were won under the pressure of more than ordinary circumstance. Advance became imperative under the goad of fear and suffering. The very times were on the side of progress. To hold to progress today is more difficult. So let us ask again, have we reached the goal of our vision of that fourth day of March, 1933? Have we found our happy valley? In this nation, I see tens of millions of its citizens, a substantial part of its whole population, who at this very moment are denied the greater part of what the very lowest standards of today call the necessities of life. I see one third of a nation ill housed, ill clad, ill nourished. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Hop in the cab. Come on. Hop in the cab, all of you. Hey, ain't you Eddie Cantor from the radio? Yeah. You know you're getting away with murder? Oh. <laughs> On behalf of the state and the greater Texas and Pan American Exposition opening at Dallas, June the 12th, I herewith name you, Eddie Cantor, my personal representative to commission Miss Deanna Durbin, honorary Payanita of the cause of Texas girls who will act as official hostesses for our 1937 International Exposition. Deanna, no one could be better suited to represent to all of the nations of the Western Hemisphere the ideal American girl. So long, children. Yep. Oh, what street is this we're driving on? Oh, we're driving here. This is Sunset Boulevard. This part here is called the Strip. You want to go to a burlesque show? No, no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, our next number is dedicated to the Girl Scouts of America, who are celebrating this week their 25th anniversary. <laughs>
a sermon, what a sermon, preached by Parson Brown. Tell it to ya, tell it to ya. Told each sister, told each sister, time to settle down. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Potatoes are cheaper, tomatoes are cheaper. Now the time of fall in love. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker gave their prize a downward shove. Grab yourself someone to fry your eggs and bacon. She can live just like a queen, I'll watch your making. You'll find it simply delicious to help with the dishes. Now's the time to fall in love. Sweets are much cheaper, movie seats are much cheaper. Now's the time to fall in love. A talky scene tender to make her surrender. You should take advantage of. When the picture's over, take her where it's quiet. Just remember what the hero did and try it. You're not a tailor or gable, but do what you're able. Now's the time to fall in love. This is WMAQ, the Chicago Daily News Station. Five seconds until 7 p.m., B-U-L-O-V-A, Bolivar Watch Time. Ah, imagine it, Molly. One hundred consecutive broadcasts. <laughs> Seems just like a dream. Like a dream? Hmm. Why, that's what the sponsor said the other night. Almost. What do you mean, almost? Well, he didn't say it was a dream, exactly. He just said he hadn't slept very good for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, anyway, it's, anyway, it's like, like Zan says to me. That's my brother, Alexander. Oh. Like Dan says when he was working on the roof and his wristwatch fell off. He says he never saw the time go so fast. <laughs> I was talking about Rosemont. I heard you won some money on him last week. Oh. oh. <laughs> we thought you were congratulating us on our 100th broadcast for Johnson's Wax. Yeah. Your 100th broadcast? Say, is that all it's been? Seems like a thousand. Say, boys, you know what? <laughs> Why? Why, the ungratitude of that guy. <laughs> He ought to be proud to be associated with us. One hundred performances. Say, I'll bet some of those other radio shows envy us. Oh, sure. Mm. Poor old Rudy Valley. Mm. He's only been on the air about seven years. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rudy Valley's an exception. I mean... And Amos and Andy. They've only been on about eight or nine years. They'll never catch up with us now. Oh. <laughs> you know what I meant. One hundred weeks, and they say it only takes a year to really establish a show. Well, it only takes 20 minutes to establish a beautiful finish on your floors in linoleum with Johnson's glow coat. And look, Hi, no... Paul. Oh, hello, folks. Excuse me for butting in. I guess I was just carried away by my enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. As long as you're carried away, I don't care what does it. Now, McGee, remember Mr. Wilcox has been with us for 100 weeks. That's right. And say, Fibber, it's certainly been swell. Working with you two? Working? <laughs> Working? <laughs> Why, all you do is mention Johnson's wax a couple of times. <laughs> oh, now listen, McGee. Mr. Wilcox has worked hard. Why, just look at him. All bent over with work and worry. <laughs> yes. Why don't you straighten your shoulders, Harpo? Stand up like a man. What's the idea of going around all bent over like that? Well, I just got tired of being a straight man for you, that's all. So long. <laughs> you know, sis. Fibber McGee and Molly? Who? Fibber McGee and Molly. Monday night. What about Monday night? We're on then. On the radio. Gee, me too. Who do you listen to? <laughs> we don't listen. We broadcast. Fibber McGee and Molly. Haven't you got a radio? You could listen on mine if you wanted to. Oh, Listen, sis, uh, well, we're radio actors. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> we're on every Monday. Listen to us sometime. Gee, I don't have time Mondays. I'm always listening to the radio Mondays. Oh, oh God, dear. God, God. Get on with the telegram, McGee. Okay, you come back in a few minutes, sis. i got to compose the telegram. Certainly, sir. If there's anything of which I can do to be of service to you, just let me know, sir. <laughs>
I miss you tonight, stop. I wish I could kiss you tonight, stop. Want to let you know just how I am. So I'm sending you this telegram. The weather is rainy and cold, stop. The next house to our house was sold, stop. Lovely neighbors moved in by the way. Came around to borrow eggs today. Here's some news that's really news. Mr. Brown became a pop. Don't forget to wire and say congratulations, stop. My darling, there's so much to write, stop. A letter will follow tonight, stop. Wonder if you're lonely as I am. Now I've got to close this telegram. I love you, stop. Mean it, stop. Phone me, stop. Write me, stop. But don't stop loving me. Why, at one time, every telegraph operator in the country knew my hand on the key. Oh. Every time they heard tidit, 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 dit, dit, they'd say, well, well, there's old Morse Code McGee. Oh. Morse Code McGee, they called me in them days. Oh. Morse Code McGee, miracle man of messages and magnificent metal marble making monkeys of minor minions messing with Morse. Oh. McGee, remember your promise to stick to the truth. <laughs> Thanks for listening to 1937 Part 5, the Soundscapes Audio Montage Series Number 14, from When Radio Ruled. I'm Mike Gillette, your host. When Radio Ruled and the Soundscape Series are before TV productions. Copyright 2022. Welcome back, our little singer, Judy Shaw. Wait between your mother-in-law, one thing, dear mother-in-law. You got ready to put your funny book and take it short. Wait dear mother-in-law, don't stop the child of your nose. Just hop away from my toes. You get to be on any floor, you get to be on. Come now, the front for the floor.
Thank <laughs> you.